Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. This morning we're going to be talking about witnessing. And in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, which is, uh, by the way, is on your paper there too. And it says here, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. This is known in Bible time uh, areas that this is called the Great Commission, and is one of the most significant passages in the Bible for this reason. First, the last recorded personal instruction by Christ given to his disciples. Second, it's a special calling for Jesus Christ to all his followers, us as Christians, to take a specific action while we're on earth. Now, again, this is known as the Great Commission. But I want you to understand something, the way this works, because people misinterpret this. And, and I learned this many years ago when I was in college and had uh, taken Greek and studied the thing in the Greek here. Uh, going into the world can be interpreted a different way in the Greek. It comes out actually really neat in the Greek. Here's the way it comes out in the Greek. While you're there, preach the gospel to every creature. Now I'm going to show you the significance of what that means to us. It says, while you're at work, be a witness to me. While you're at home, be a witness to me. While you're at play, be a witness to me. While you're shopping, be a witness to me. In other words, wherever you are, at any given moment, be a testimony for Christ. That's what that verse is literally saying. See, we, we have a tendency to think of it as, well, you know, it's a preacher thing. Go into all the world. It's a missionary go into all the world. That's not what it's really saying. It's saying to all of us, wherever we are. Now, what? how are we to be a testimony for Christ? Because that can be... I'm going to show you something that's really neat. One of the greatest tools each of us have as Christians is our testimony. It's the best, greatest tool we have. Telling people what God is doing in your life is a great witnessing tool. You talk about planting seeds, you have, and, and, and what's really neat about it, it's easy to do because you know you don't have to memorize something. you got it in your head already, whatever God's been doing to you, say this week or this month or whatever. Uh, and it's easy to talk about to other people. Okay, the, fact, the only thing you have to do is learn to talk to, I guess, people you may not know as much. Now, I'm going to give you an illustration here. <laughs> Uh, I think I've given this before, but I, I still want to give you something how God dealt with me. On well, bike night, back in the old days when it was over at Hooters, uh, I was with a group of guys there, and I was the only guy that I believe was saved in the group, maybe four or five. And it was not too long. I had just gotten back a week or two from Myrtle Beach. And uh, every man had his story about something, and it got to me, and I started talking about my trip because I had hit a deer at uh, roughly about 3 o'clock in the morning on 26 between here and Columbia. And I, and I was by myself that day uh, heading down to Myrtle Beach. And it was dark where I hit it. Uh, rather than go through the whole story, I hit the deer. But for whatever reason, and I always said, by the grace of God, I didn't run over the deer after I hit him. And the only thing I can think of as I reminisced about it is the rear feet of that deer must have been in the air at that moment of impact. And rather than knock the deer forward, I knocked, swung him around at, at the point. That's the only, because I didn't go over him after I hit him. And, uh, and I knew there was damage, but I couldn't see anything because my handlebars were like this after that. And it wasn't because the handlebar got bent. My whole front end literally moved on me. So I made it to a front, uh, to a, a first gas station, which was a couple miles up the road. I was afraid the fender had went into the tire, and I wanted to stop that, but that was okay. I couldn't straighten it out. I didn't have the tools, and I didn't have the strength to straighten it out, so I finished that whole trip. <laughs> when I got to, when I got to uh, the hotel, which a lot of guys I knew were at the hotel there, 
uh, over the years, and I told them I had hit a deer at some point, and they all, yeah, right, right. And you're you're here now, and you, yeah, I said, yeah, go look at the bike. And they went up, they came back, and went, you really did hit a deer. <laughs> and uh, they all got together and straightened my fork out the best they could for my trip home, and then I fixed it when I got home. But what happened was I decided I was talking about that. Now, I just shared with you a little bit about how God blessed and all that. But during that conversation with those guys, I left God out of the conversation. I just simply said, you know, I hit the deer, and I must have been lucky, and and it popped up and all that. Well, on my way home that night on the bike, God got a hold of my heart and said, how can you left me out of that? And I had no good reason. I didn't think they would understand was if I was going to say anything. It wasn't because I wasn't afraid to say it. It was just I didn't think they understand, so I left it out. And I remember saying to God that from that moment on, I will never let it out again. It doesn't matter whether they are saved or not. It doesn't matter whether they even understand it or not. What matters is you're planting a seed by giving God the praise for something he did in your life. And that's witnessing. It's planting a seed. You may never lead that person to the Lord. Someone else may lead them to the Lord. But you know what? Uh, someday you may hear that, oh, because of what he did or what she did, that changed my life. And eventually I came to know Christ as my Savior. And we'll probably hear about that when we all get to heaven. So the biggest lesson God gave me was, was that story. And from this, I just put God in everything I talk to. I don't care if it's my neighbor, my relatives. I don't care if they're atheists. I don't care. I'm going to give them what God's done for me. And all. So that's a way that we can witness without, you know, there's nothing wrong with going with tracts. There's nothing wrong with quoting Bible scripture or nothing. All that's good too. But if you can't do that to start off with, you got your testimony, what God's been doing for you in your life. So there's another part of our testimony which requires no talking. Let's say you're in a room of people, maybe a luncheon or a classroom or maybe a, a meeting or of something where there's a bunch of people in the room and you're in that room and you get to talk to them, whatever the situation, and then you leave the room. Now you go back home, whatever. And after you leave, uh, something, some of the people start talking. Not all, everybody left at the same time. And they went, did you know that guy? Did you talk to that guy, Glenn? I said, yeah. They said, did you notice something different about him? Now, the reason why I'm saying that is you, when you went into that room, you didn't wear a cross. You didn't have something that said Jesus Christ on you or a patch or anything else. You didn't carry a Bible. You didn't say praise God or anything. Now, I'm not saying this is what you're supposed to do. I'm just saying it's hypothetical. So there was no reason for them to read or see something or hear something that would indicate that you were a Christian. And yet when you left that room... They went, there's something different about that person. And believe me, they can sense that. I've run across it several times. <laughs> Once up at the, with the VW dealership when I helped the guy unload his tools. And, uh, and I sensed that this guy was a Christian. And what was really funny, I finally witnessed to him and just asked him. I said, I can't help but notice. I think, you, do you know the Lord is your Savior? And the next thing he said just blew me away. He said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing about you. And I thought, well, see, there is something about us as Christians. People do notice something, and that's another form of witnessing. But now, take that and add your testimony and other things to the Lord, you know, that brings honor to the Lord, and you talk about a witnessing tool. Amazing. They will see, and they do notice. And and even though when we never, never think about it. I actually had a, a... I forget the name of the, the company, but when I was in deputation raising money to to, to uh, do this, uh, I had to work part time whenever I had availability to uh, help a guy that I knew owned a garage. And uh, one day I came in on a Monday to ask, "Do you have any work for me?" Because I didn't do it every day. It's only when I was, you know, had t- uh, free time. And they said, "We've been talking about you this weekend." This actually happened. And, and I said, well, I hope it was something good, you know, being funny. And they said, we noticed that you're always happy. I went, really? <laughs> but 
I just thought that was pretty neat. And the uh, second time, first time in my life, it was a couple weeks after I got saved. I worked for a VW dealership in Maryland as a mechanic. And uh, one of the mechanics came up to me and says, Glenn, we noticed that you've changed a lot. You know, and uh, see, I wasn't hanging around when they were telling dirty jokes. Uh, I didn't make a big deal out of it. In other words, I just slowly just left. And you know, and eventually, they thought I was sticking my nose up at them. But eventually, when they saw I was for real, they became my friends again. And you know. and so there's two lessons God really taught me about things, and all of us can do it. So the next thing is. We are to share what we know about Christ with others, and that is considered what witnessing. You might not, you might say, "I don't know a lot," but that's fine. Just tell them what you do know. I mean, just share it as a testimony. That's it. You don't have to force the scripture down. Throw it. If they start asking questions and you don't know the answer, I will tell you what I say. I don't know the answer. I tell them I don't know the answer, but I said I can find out for you. I can call somebody, you can call me. If I don't know the answer, I can find the answer out. I can look it up. I got a huge library at my house, big library. So remember that 12 disciples changed the world during their time. 12 people changed the world. And we can too. D.L. Moody once said, The world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully concentrate, consecrated to him. One man or one woman can literally change things in the world if we just try. Now, I'm not saying that we should get up today and go out and try to change the world. But change the world you live in. The people you see. Your relatives. Your friends. Uh, people you happen to come across. You meet. Someone told me uh, a couple weeks ago, says, Glenn, how do you witness the people? He says, I notice you don't go up to strangers and start talking. I said, no, because I don't want to turn somebody off. Uh, and matter of fact, I used you as an illustration. I said, when I'm with evil, he knows people that come up and talk to him, and they always introduce me. And that's how I meet. I meet somebody new. I, if I get an opportunity to talk to them, fine. If I don't, the next time I see them, I give them a card or whatever. And I try to do it without ramming it down their throat. And I use the other people uh, that introduce me. And that's how I try to do it. Because too many people over the years have go in trying to ram the gospel down people's throats. And I just shared... Uh, uh, what. Were you in Cherokee with me at any time when I used to set up right at the campsite under the tree? Okay. Uh, when I used to set up at the, uh, when I say campsite, the, the rally itself, the old rally at the ceremony oh, ground. Okay. Well, anyhow, the, uh, the, the, uh, the outlaws would come by, and I knew a couple of them, so they would always hang around, not at me, but in that area. Well, the one time this happened, they had a, uh, it's called, uh, I'm not going to mention the name because we're going to, what do you call it? There was a Christian group of bikers showed up and went over and started witnessing to them. I saw that there was a, things weren't going well over there. <laughs> from the, so uh, later after they left, I talked to the guy I knew from the outlaw and said, what's going on? And he said, those people came up and started doing it. And I said, who the heck do they think they are? And they were pushing the gospel at them. They were just coming up pushing it. And they didn't understand how to approach it. And see, I, there was a guy down in Daytona that used to hand out for the swap meet on the street. His name's Dave. And, uh, and uh, to this day, I don't know if he ever accepted the Lord. But he became friends. He would actually come looking for me. And I witnessed to him. But I waited for the right opportunity if he said something. Then I would talk to him. Then if I saw that he was, his face was, you could tell if a guy's getting turned off, you know. If and right away I'd go back to the Harley Davidson, or I just change the subject. Well, come to find out, he would look. If I didn't even come down there, he would call me up, asking me where I am, how come I'm not down there. Now, that gave me more opportunities to witness to him rather than he ignore me or go the opposite direction. Because, oh, he's a religious nut. I don't want nothing to do with him. So to me, there is the right way of approaching the gospel. Now, in the old days, 
during Billy Sunday and Moody and all, we could get, do things like that. We could hit them and all. But times have changed. You're lucky you go door to door visitation and get someone to answer the door and you, you can hear them in the house. Times have changed. But our testimony is awesome. And you can just share it with people. A personal calling. God is calling every Christian to set out in faith and spread the good news. We have friends, we have relatives, uh, we have neighbors, all need to hear Jesus Christ. You know, I, I got to the point being a, 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 my past thing as a mechanic. Nowadays, there's not a whole lot I can do on computerized vehicles, but uh, <laughs> he just reminded me one at Cherokee. I don't know why they came up to me. Maybe because I was on a Harley, they figure, well, I had to be a mechanic because I owned a Harley. <laughs> a go-wig guy came up to me. I didn't know he had a go-wig. He says, could you help me? My bike won't start. And I walk on down, and I see this big go-wing. I've never touched a go-wing. I don't know where, you know where the battery is. And, uh, and, uh, and I said, listen, you got a go-wing. I said, he said, but could you try to help me? I said, okay, where's your battery? You know, he, I said, well, you take that off and all. And eventually I figured out he needed the battery, and I got it started. But I told him, don't shut it down until you're someplace you can put a battery in. He says, okay. And he had three or four friends, uh, and they were all on go-wings. And I decided to be funny, and I turned around, and I said, I want you to remember something. I said, come here. I had them all get around. He said, remember, a Harley guy got you running. <laughs> we have the gift, and we need to spread it. Who has God put in your heart to share the gift of salvation? And even if somebody decides to come and say, how do I get saved, and you're not sure how to approach it, say, listen, I want you to meet somebody. Let me get you with that. See, there's always a way around something. You don't have to be an expert at something. Uh, when I was working with, uh, I'm working, I didn't get paid for it, but I helped some of you, which is out behind Furman uh, Baptist Church. I used to help the youth department, and somehow I got put in charge of visitation back then. And I used to tell people, you know, they'd be afraid to go. I, I don't want to talk to people and all. I said, do me a favor. I said, what if I let you go, and you come, but you don't have to say a word? Just be there for the, I'm going to have you with somebody else, and they're going to do all the talking. And I got a lot of volunteers. I said, the only thing you have to do is in, to yourself, pray that God's will would be done to whoever's being witnessed to I said, number two, they may have kids. You may need to babysit the kids a minute or something. You'll be a great help. This is what was my plan. I knew that eventually they would start talking on their own. And it happened, one after another after another. Not that I had that many, but what happens is I didn't have to say nothing. They just started picking up and talking themselves. And uh, people got to get used to it. When I went to be saved, the first, my wife and I went to Summit, not Summit, Granite uh, Baptist Church up in Maryland. My parents kept aggravating us to, to go visit. They were saved, we weren't. Uh, I went there and I heard the gospel on a Sunday morning. I wanted to go forward to find out more about it. And you know what kept me from going forward? I had the strongest grip on to that pure. I wouldn't let go. <laughs> I was afraid to go in front of all those people. I really was. So Sunday night, I heard it again. I came back, I wanted to hear more. I had that same problem. I couldn't let go of that pew. As I was standing up, and I'm not joking you. I mean, I held on for dear life because I didn't want to go up in front of all those people, and so I did what any chicken would do. I invited the pastor to come to my house, <laughs> and then I asked him questions, and he showed me that. And my wife and I both came to know the Lord that night. Over the years, uh, there, on a Sunday night, he would pick somebody out of the the um, audience and have him come up, and he would not let you just sit there. He would just ask you questions. When did you get saved, Glenn? You know? But for some reason, he picked on me a lot. Now, I don't mean every Sunday, but he picked on me a lot. And guess what happened? I got used to being up in front of people. Everybody can learn to talk to people. It's just a matter of practice. 
practice, practice, practice. And that's what the pool guy says after he makes all those shots. You ever see that on TV in the old days? And the guy says, how, how, do you, how did you learn that? He, and his answer was, practice, practice, practice. And Remember the day you got saved, the Holy Spirit was sealed into you from the uh, moment you got saved. It te- teaches that in Ephesians. Christ promised that he will be with you every step of the way. God's there with you, and you can pray. And I'll be first to tell you, and I'm sure I've said this before, I can't tell you how many times I've witnessed the people at the rallies or whatever, and nothing happened. And after they left, about 20 minutes later, I remembered verses I needed to say to them while I was there. And I go, Lord, please help me remember the verses when I need to use them. So what I do is I do a lot of praying about that. Lord, help me. Because I knew the verses. I just didn't think of quoting the verses at that time. Which, So it takes practice on everything we do. But just remember, you got a great tool already. Your, your testimony. Let's pray. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.